I'm Sasha Nicole. And I'm Star. And I'm Dr. T. And this is American Therapy, the definitive podcast on all things Black mental health. And today, I am super excited. I made sure to change it to my orange and blue because Star always gets to throw in the school in North Carolina. But today, we get to represent my school, the Virginia State University. And so we're super excited. So tell us what we're talking about, Star. And I'm going to introduce our amazing guest that I'm super as you see, excited to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> so we have an illustrious guest today, all. And you know, we all love all of our HBCUs because they are the beacon of Black greatness. So today we have one of the bastions of Black greatness in America today, as we stand, um, who's shepherding our young Black leaders into greatness. And so we're gonna talk about, you know, what does it mean to lead the next generation of black leaders and develop that talent? What are the stresses? What are the tools that this great leader is using and doing at his institution to facilitate that we make it to the next step in this long race for equity and justice? Absolutely. So our esteemed guest today, we have the president of Virginia State University. Say that Dr. one more time with some bass in your voice. <laughs> <laughs> the president of Virginia State University. We have Dr. Makola Abdullah. His bio is extensive, so I'm going to read a little bit and just give some, some bullet points of the amazing work that he's been doing. Uh, he was named president on February 1st, 2016. He became the 14th president of Virginia State University. He also emphasizes several focus areas to sustain Virginia State as an 1890 land-grant university. The areas of focus include providing a transformative experience for students, strategically investing in academic programs, partnering with others as university to tell the VSU story, embracing the university's land-grant mission, and embracing VSU's role as a Virginia Opportunity University. Under his leadership, some things that he's done, he's been named by Essence as the nation's top 20 best colleges for African Americans. Uh, he established partnerships with local public school systems. He established the university's advisory board for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning intersex alley uh, inclusion for the institution to be a more affirming learning environment. And in 2018, the HBCU was named, well, in 2018, it was named HBCU of the Year and awarded Best Board of Trustees of the Year and Female Student of the Year by HBCU Digest, an online blog. Additionally, in 2017, President Abdullah was named the HBCU Male President of the Year. And Virginia State is ranked as number 19 historically black college or university from the 2019 US News World Report of Best Colleges Ranking. So super excited. You, um, it's a pleasure, you know, especially, you know, being my alma mater, like I'm stoked. I love Virginia State. I had an amazing time at Virginia State. And so we just want to dive right in, like what it's been like for you as a leader, but not only as a leader, but as a black man leading through this tenure and now having to lead through this new normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is. Um, well, one, thank you so much for having me. Uh, all of you, it's just, it's just great to be here. Um, I love hearing the word illustrious because when you hear the word illustrious you know you're talking to some hbcu people and you're about to talk about some hbcu stuff because we only say that word when it's time to describe our institutions the illustrious virginia <laughs> state university um so and thank you so much as as an alum of inviting me here and wearing your orange and blue um i think everyone already knows you, you all may not know who not virginia state i wear orange and blue every day i've been wearing orange and blue every day since the day i got the job every single day right you you see the wall behind me is orange the chair is orange the thing i mean i'm i'm all in i don't i don't play with this thing but anyway i digress um i love uh being the president of virginia state uh it brings me a, a great amount of, of of joy uh virginia state is a wonderful wonderful place uh full of great people vsu is people number one um and the students are just incredible and the amount of love and uh, that we get from them and it kind of keeps us going and so i'm uh, it is it is one of the pleasures of my life. Um, my daughter graduated from Virginia State in uh, December of 18. Uh, she is back now working on her master's degree. And so, you know, VSU is not just, I'm not just, a, I'm not just a president, but I'm a client, right? My, my, my money is in, is in school. And so um, I'm, I'm proud of where we are and, and what we're trying to do as we move forward. Um, particularly proud, thank you for bringing up the LGBTQIA uh, task force and some of the work that we're doing there. That's that's really of particular importance to me, and, and I'm glad when it gets recognized and highlighted in my bio. 
uh, now this is now kind of transitioning, right? These are really incredible times, uh, incredible times in our country. Uh, COVID-19 has shown the incredible inequities that exist in our healthcare system with African-Americans being more heavily impacted uh, by COVID-19. It's, it's shown the incredible inequities in our economic system uh, with African-Americans being among the first to be laid off. Um, it's showing the incredible inequities in our education system. Uh, we have dedicated, smart, intelligent, and motivated young people who have trouble getting work done because they either don't have the computers, they don't have access to broadband, or don't have a convenient place to do their, their schoolwork. Uh, and then the incidents that happened this summer with uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor uh, have pointed out the incredible inequities that exist uh, in our criminal justice system. And none of these problems are easy. None of them are going away anytime soon. Uh, and now the challenge is how do we navigate uh, really through this space? And I'm going to tell you, it is, it is incredible. I didn't, I, I say this all the time and I'm not joking. I didn't, I didn't sign up to be a pandemic president. You know, I mean, I, I thought I was going to be a regular HBCU president. And now all of us, all the presidents in the space uh, at black schools or white schools, our CEOs of companies are now navigating times that they are really you know, trying to wrap their minds around. And so uh, we're doing the very best we can. I think it's forced us all to be a little bit more authentic and vulnerable uh, and understand that everything, we don't know everything as we try to move forward um, uh, and trying to keep people at front of mind. You know, how do you, how do you keep your faculty, your staff, your students at front of mind uh, and make the best decisions for Virginia State today and for tomorrow. So when I'm doing, ma'am, I'm doing the very best that I can. That's uh, that's all I can do. Can you talk a little bit about like, you, you talk about, um, you know, Breonna Taylor and yesterday was emotional day for, I think everybody in America, definitely black America, like, what is it that's unique about that HBCU experience and specifically, you know, Virginia State that is how that is preparing our young, our next, you know, great leaders to take on this fight? Because like you said, this is this is not going to be over anytime soon. This is a long fight and preparing those people, those young folk to take on that fight and win the fight. Mm -hmm. what, what, what first, uh, uh, Dr. T, are you an HBCU grad? Too? I am not. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we still, <laughs> we still love you. All the way. <laughs> we still love you. We still love you. So, um, no, she's still. One of the things that HBCUs do, and Virginia State does for, for young people, is it allows them to be unapologetically Black in who they are, right? And so, I graduated from Howard. I was young. I, I went to Howard. Howard is my, my second favorite school, Sasha. My second favorite school. My first is Virginia State University. My second favorite school is Howard. But I graduated Howard at 20. I graduated high school at 16, graduated from college at 20, and went and got my PhD at Northwestern, and I got my PhD at 24. I say all of that to say that when I went to Northwestern, I essentially lived another college experience at a PWI. So I'm one of the few people, I had them both. So even though I was in graduate school, I hung out with all the undergrads, I played ball, I did all the things I wanted to do um, as an undergrad student at Northwestern. And the thing that I realized was the great benefit of Howard was not that people were more, were more black. That certainly wasn't true. Black, black students at PWIs are as, are as black as they come. Um, but it was more that when, when I was in a class at Northwestern, I was the black kid in class. And so if there was something that was wrong or something that wasn't going right, I had to uphold the entire tradition of African-Americans in every class and in every environment. And that's something that students at HBCUs don't have to do, right? They really can just be themselves. You can be the smart person in class. You can be the not so smart person in class, right? You can be the person who kind of who clowns around or you can be serious and you're ultimately judged for who you are and you don't have to uphold the entire race with all of your behavior, right? And I think that extra pressure that it puts on students at PWIs is why so many, why in graduate school, HBCU graduates are overrepresented in graduate school because after they finish their undergraduate career, they're more likely to continue to go on because they're not stressed out by the, everything else that happens in school. Uh, and I think that's really good as, as we watch young people start to develop who they are and grow into who they are that they're not worried about what do people think about the blackness that I portray, right? How is the blackness that I portray, how is that going to impact other people and how is it going to impact my life? You can just be, you can be a skateboard rider or, 
or or a militant or you can like rock music or you can not like you know you you can be the black that you are because at an HBCU you're going to find somebody just like you who's black like you right and so I, I think that initial development is, is, is what's critically important. Uh, and it helps to create those leaders uh, who can go out and do some, do some fantastic things. So I don't know. I, I hope I answered the question. I, I think I answered my own question. So. so Dr. T, I mean, one of the things that Dr. Abdullah said, what I heard and what spoke to me was identity. Mm-hmm. And, you know, especially within this climate where there are so many young and old who are still searching for their own identity um, and, and who they are. And I know with, with you going to a PWI, can you also speak to maybe some of your experience, but then now as an esteemed mental health professional, a psychiatrist, like how do we address the concerns of identity? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, you know, identity is something that develops over time. People oftentimes used to think in childhood and adolescence, but we now know that that continues into the 20s and sometimes early 30s. Um, as people are experienced and exposed to more. So so starting with myself, you know, I grew up in Gary, Indiana, which at the time was literally a part of this federal program of model cities. It was one of the few uh, black communities that was run by a black mayor. All the city council was black. Like it was literally in a program called model cities. Um, And so when I went to look at (laughs) HBCUs as when I was applying to college, I was like, this is just like home. <laughs> so I had that experience. Um, and so that was one of the reasons and finances <laughs> why I chose PWI, state school, free with you know my grades and stuff. Uh, and I knew I was going to medical school, which was gonna incur an expense, right? And so I think identity is critically important. And depending on the persons and the child's, the young adult stage of development, they may need different things. And I love that HBCUs provide a nurturing environment where the student can blossom. Mm -hmm. They can see different role models. So people come to HBCUs with a wide variety of experiences. But the thing that I think is probably more different, I went to a large state school, 36,000 students back then, now they have way more. There were 900 black people. Mm -hmm. So we all knew each other. Right. We it, it, it was like, you know, but there was no other black person in my major. So in some ways that disconnected me from other black people because that university was known for engineering. So 700 of those 900 black people were literally in the engineering department. And so me being in healthcare, social sciences, I didn't have anybody in any of my classes. I didn't have anybody that I knew. Um, from my peer group. So I, I was with them on the weekends and evenings, but when I studied, I didn't have black people to study with. And so definitely those kinds of experiences shape who you are as you're figuring out. And young adulthood, those late teens, early twenties is a critical time to try on different parts of yourself. And if you're doing that in an environment that may not reflect back positively about who you are, that can be very challenging and you can start to absorb those things as reality versus everybody during their late adolescence and early adulthood is trying on different stuff. Relationships are funky, friendships are funky. (laughs) That's just natural. And you're also trying on different leadership styles. Am I going to be a joiner? Am I going to be someone who isn't afraid to be bold and rise to the top? Am I going to run, you know, things by committee and kind of get consensus and your comfort level at being able to try on all of those things as you figure out yourself and your leadership style and you know what you want to do um, is is critically important for that to be supported. So does that mean that students who choose PWIs can't get that? Of course not. Um, does it mean that some students might do better in an environment that is going to reflect who they are, who they want to be, what they may have missed? Um, give them models that they didn't have in their own family. Like there are so, so many um, opportunities that a a student of color could have at a a historically black college or university that they just may not get at a PWI. Mm -hmm. So it's really up to the individual, their family to number one, just be aware of it, Mm -hmm. to make an informed choice. If you know that you're a child that needs 
more support and nurturing, if you know that you're a bit more independent, like all of those things should be considered. My, I actually, as you guys know now, have a daughter that's a high school senior. And so we're looking at, you know, all of these things, like who are you? Where are you gonna feel comfortable? <laughs> And where, where is going to support your nurturing, your growth and development the best, right? Because the next four years are all about you becoming who you want to be. Yeah. And so I really think that HBCUs do a great job. Um, and not that some PWIs don't, some don't. I mean, let's just be honest, some don't, right? Um, but some do. Um, but it's still, I actually had a conversation yesterday, um, the medical school I went to, Case Western Reserve University, fabulous, fabulous medical school, but they have struggled for two or three generations with recruiting and retaining black doctors and black medical students to become black physicians. And this, this particular doctor that I was talking to yesterday, he went there before me and he was retelling the same stories that I retold. And last year, I actually, a diversity consultant that the university hired um, called me to do an interview because the university was still trying to figure out what should we do, right? So it's wonderful that they're trying to figure that out, but they're still trying to figure it out, <laughs> right? And so it just really depends on what a student needs. Um, the family and the student should really think about who they are, where they are in their identity development, in their personality development, and what's gonna be a good fit for them. Was the diversity consultant white? No. <laughs> See, can I pick some of that up with what she just said? Because I thought it was just really good. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I say it too, but I don't think I say it nearly as eloquent as Dr. T has said it. I'm a huge proponent of HBCUs. Um, I usually give my HBCU pedigree, and I can, I'm going to name 50 people in my family that went to different HBCUs. And I won't do that today. Um, and I think that every young black person should have an HBCU on their list as they look at going to college, right? And as a school that they should visit, they should apply to. But I really do firmly believe that it is an individual choice and it's a family choice. Uh, and that it's not the best for everyone. Um, and I think it's important whether you're talking about finances or location or different kinds of majors. But I think it's important for families to really take the time to make the right decision um, for whoever's going to, going to college. It's, it's an intensely personal decision. And so I, though I am a proponent and an advocate for HBCUs, I'm not one of those people who thinks that everybody, every black kid should go, every black kid should apply, every black kid should visit, but then it's important to make the right decision for you and your family. I just wanted to make that clear. <laughs> So what do you say, Dr. Abdullah, like, you know, everyone, it's election season, Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, social justice is popular right now. Hopefully it remains popular. HBCUs often get, I don't want to say used, but I'm going to say used <laughs> as taglines, as a sales tactic, um, to, for people to show they're aligning with the black community, oftentimes without making any or a sizable financial contribution. How do we protect the brand of our great institutions? you know, in this season of like, it's the flavor of the day from a standpoint of, oh, we're going to do a stop at HBCU. Oh, you know, we're, we're, in, we're invested in diversity because we have hiring or we have an event at an HBCU, yet we don't see that rise up to the top when it comes to the millions of dollars of funding. You're starting to see that. And you, don't, you certainly don't see that in the boardrooms and in the mix of leadership in corporate America, you got the CEO of Wells Fargo saying he can't find anybody black to hire. Right, right. No, no. I look. I I hear you. We we've got to get beyond the press release, okay? So even when we start talking about candidates and and folks running for office, is that they have platforms and their platforms should and need to include HBCUs. And when they do, we as the electorate have to hold them responsible for the words that they told us that they were going to do. And it's the same for the corporations that it's not enough to do one commercial. It's not enough to show up on a, on a campus once or give out five scholarships. Uh, we've got to hold their feet to the fire as a collective unit, as, as black people. We have to be able to move past that first press release, that first uh, thing that gets our attention. Uh, and when we're able to do that, um, I think we'll really see the kind of prolonged investment in our institutions and in our communities. Uh, but so many times, as you know, like. 
you know, this summer, but two summers ago, you couldn't get anybody to say Black Lives Matter, right? Everybody was avoiding the phrase. Well, now everybody's saying it, right? And that's good. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad that that, that kind of progress has been made and that, and that the young people, because really they've been driving the movement, have driven the movement to a point where it's now something that people have to say in order to be a part of this, the new America right now. Um, but how do we push people now past that, past that remark? It's, it's not enough to put out a good press release and a good statement. It's not enough to say that you're going to be committed uh, to us. If you're an elected official, um, where's the money going? Um, if you're in business, how many people directly work for you who are a people of color? That's, that's the only question I had. You just wrote a really nice letter. That's great. How many people who report to you in, in important positions um, are African-American or Latino-American um, or women? Uh, and to start to ask the really critical questions of people and not let them get away uh, with a fancy statement. Uh, we've got to go beyond beyond that. And so capturing that right now, right? We are the, you know, HBCUs in some ways are the flavor of the month, um, but we will continue to be the flavor if we can make sure that we articulate the idea that we're incredible investment and we hold people's feet to the fire when they say that they're going to be a part of that investment. You can't come, you know, you're not going to come through and do a press release and take a picture with me and then leave. I'm, I'm, I'm not going for it. And, and, if, and if that's all you got, then you can do that somewhere else. Right? I'm looking for real investment because I got real kids at Virginia State who need real money in order to chase their very real dreams. Uh, and we don't have time for the uh, shenanigans or as our, um, as our elders would say, we don't have time for the foolishness. So speaking of investments, yes. how do we as alumni you know when i see like in the news and you have different people who always make these large donations to you only hear two specific schools <laughs> right, right and right. i never hear you know the jackson states the virginia states the bethune cookmans you know and the list goes on is there something that we can do to start being able to solicit some of those large don donations that just so that we can continue to prosper unlike just only those two certain schools. I mean, it's not to say that it's not good because I, I want to make that clear. I'm not unhappy for those schools, but I want to be able to know, like, because you have so many of our HBCUs who who aren't making it either. Right. You know, you had I think was it Benedict or one of those where yeah. you, know, you had the whole um, social media push because they were about to close. So it's like we we need more dollars into our schools, and we're not necessarily getting that, and we need more than just tuition. So is there something that we can do to help? navigate that more so so first i'm gonna i'm gonna reiterate what you just said right and that is i'm happy for all of my schools that got they got paid you know i mean legitimately happy you know do i wish it was virginia state yes i do uh but am i hating on my brothers and sisters no i'm not i was just talking to, to president howard today wayne frederick and i and i actually said that to him today i've said it before but i said it today uh, to let him know that i'm i'm happy that he's having that level of success um but no, it, it needs to be more broad. But, but I want you to think about it like this. If you, if you were brand new to the HBCU community and you went into Google and said, hmm, HBCU, the first schools you come up with are Hampton Howard, Morehouse, Spelman, and Xavier, right? Uh, and so part of it, we have to be excited that there are people who previously were not searching for us who are now looking. Right now, they haven't made it off the first page yet, but but they're doing the Google search, and so we want to look at that also as progress. Right, that that is progress that it'll start to manifest itself uh, in large ways, and so that's how I try to think about it. what can alums do. Um, one, alums can give. Right, because a lot of those companies want to know what is your alumni giving rate. How are your alumni? How how are your alumni doing? And it doesn't matter how much. It's really more the the number of alums that give. Uh, the second, those, those alums who are a part of major corporations, and many, of, many alums are, um, need to make sure that the corporation knows the greatness that they have is a part of the greatness of their institution, whether that school was North Carolina a and State University or Virginia State University, or heaven forbid it was Purdue, right? That if, if they know what school you came from and they appreciate your excellence, you ain't know I looked you up, Dr. T. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was like, wow, where'd that come from? Right, that's right, because I, I I'm, I'm on my thing. Um, but they need to know that your excellence is tied to the school. And you need to, 
um, reach back and tell your company that you want more of people like me, you need to head back to Virginia State University and get them. And we don't want you to just bring the talent. We need you to invest in the school that is producing talent. You've already gotten the result, right? You've already got Sasha Nicole working for you. Now the question becomes, if you want more Sasha Nicoles, you need to invest in the school. And so the kind of advocacy that happens inside corporate, is it going to, does it happen overnight? No, it does not. It does not. Um, but having alums inside uh, corporate entities that are also making that push is what alums can do and then help bring me to the table to kind of help close the deal. So I think those are the types of things. Can you share, Dr. Abdullah, a little history on like the importance and significance of being a land grant institution? Because, you know, we hear that term, but so many of us don't even really understand what that means. Okay. So let me break it down. This is, you'll forgive me because it's going to be a second. Okay. So in 1862, uh, Justin Morrill, who was a senator from Maine, uh, decided that it was important for the common man to have access to higher education. Previous to that point, it was something just for the elite. Now, when I say the elite and I say common man, right now I'm talking about white men. So I'm not talking about anybody else but white men. But it was this idea that there needed to be more of an industrial kind of education to help the new economy in the United States. That new economy was agriculture and what was called um, mechanical arts, which is the precursor to engineering. In a very real sense, it was the first STEM initiative in this country, right? And so you see universities like Texas A&M still has that agricultural mechanical, right? Uh, North Carolina A&T still has an agricultural and technical. Um, and so those schools were established in every state and the, the, the federal government granted land to the states, hence land grant, right? Gave land to the states for the purpose of starting these institutions. Um, the states sold some of the land and used the money some of them kept some of the land for the school. Some of them sold all the land and put the school somewhere else. But they used that, that money from that resource to start these colleges, which are the precursor to the public college system in this country today. And so the flagship school in most states, in, in, in Indiana, it is Purdue, is the land-grant institution. In Illinois, it's, it's University of Illinois. Uh, in Michigan, it's Michigan State. In Georgia, it's Georgia Tech. In, Florida is the University of Florida, Texas is Texas a &M. So there's a major institution that was part of the founding of those state systems. Those state systems didn't exist before then, and they started to exist after that. So it is the precursor to public higher education. Now, in 1890, the federal government said, look, because the federal government was giving money to the states for these schools every year, and they said, we're going to stop giving you money if you don't provide an education for African Americans. Right. And so in the southern states where they refused to let African-Americans go to those flagship institutions in North Carolina, it's North Carolina State, uh, in Virginia, it's Virginia Tech. Then those states established HBCUs or gave an existing HBCU the land, the designation of the agricultural school. And so then in HBCUs, there are 19 what we call 1890 land grant institutions. Right. That are in the southern states plus Tuskegee. So it's public plus Tuskegee that are providing agriculture education. In 1890, there was no land granted to those schools. So the black schools didn't get land. The only thing that happened from opening up these institutions was the states were allowed to continue to get the money they were already getting for the other school. I know that's right, isn't it? So anyway, that, that, that is the history. Um, and so there's two big pieces, I think two big draws. One of them is, is that Justin Moore really was a visionary, albeit for white men, um, in helping to establish a different kind of education, a non-elite, more of a working education, um, um, centering on jobs and entrepreneurship uh, through the Land Grant Act. And that African-Americans, when we became a part of it, we didn't get nothing. Even it's called Land Grant, we didn't get granted any land. So, and there you go. I'm, I'm sorry, I know that was a long story, but I actually like the story, so. It's important to understand that history and the underpinning of the, the you know, the equity, equitable or non-equitable distribution. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Dr. Abdullah, can you speak to, like, we never really talk a lot about, well, we had a show last season called Black Men in Leadership. Okay. And so as we also have been navigating through this new normal, 
one of the things that we've been pointing out, especially within the mental health field, is acknowledging the pain and the feelings, the emotions of men, especially Black men, because culturally, usually it's told that, you know, you're not supposed to have those things. Right, right. Is there something that you could relay to the Black man that's listening or the Black man who wants to obtain and, and have a position of leadership and where you are and, and what it's been like for you to maintain that position and how you've been able to maintain that family life balance and, and just in general, just navigate through those waters and face adversity. Yikes, yikes. I, well, first I'll say, I, I wanna thank all of you for bringing these issues to the forefront. Um, second, I'm a child, my mother is a, is a clinical psychologist. Well, she passed in October, but clinical psycho. So I grew up, my entire life was centered around the idea that mental health is important um, that being in therapy is not a bad thing, um, that it's a good thing, um, uh, and that you have to find ways really to manage uh, stress and to deal with the challenges that we deal with. Um, going, I'm gonna go backwards. If, if we start with the, the civil unrest and the incidents around the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, one of the things I thought was really interesting, and, and you know, we, we truthfully, if, you, if you're being honest, None of us are surprised at what happened. I mean, let's just keep that real, right? We're, we're not, you know, I mean, you said it earlier, we're just so surprised and shocked. None of us are surprised and shocked. Angry, yes. Surprised and shocked, no. Uh, not only that, we're not more angry um, because you can't get more angry. Um, I was angry when uh, Philando Castile uh, was murdered. I was angry when Alton Sterling was murdered. I was angry when Trayvon Martin was murdered. I was angry when Sandra Bland was murdered. And so, the idea that I'd be more angry because George Floyd is murdered would, would mean that I wasn't angry enough before. You know, I mean, to be black in America, to be a black man and a black woman in America is to be, is to live with perpetual anger, frustration, um, and sometimes a feeling of, 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 of hopelessness uh, that you can't stop this from happening to someone else and that you could be next because you're not, no matter if you're a president of an institution or you have an MD from, 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 from something that you're not immune uh, to the challenge. And so I, th I think that is, and again, we all are, that's, that's not black men in leadership, right? That's, that's, that's black man in America. Um, I, I, I used to play ball at a park. Um, I'm not gonna say where because uh, somebody will go to the park, but I, I like to play ball. When I played a lot, I played in the hood. I'd go, those are the best games and I'd play every weekend. And you would watch people who were mild mannered people, like the anger and frustration, and they would get fights every weekend. And you're seeing people, and I, I used to watch it and say, here are people who they can't express their frustration at work. And so now they come out here and they're not gonna let, they're not gonna let me punk them, right? That's not gonna happen, right? They are gonna fight me because they gotta get it out. Uh, and so we all, I think, try to deal with it in our own special way. I, I think you add to that um, with the pandemic and having to literally now make decisions in some way or another that can have life or death consequences. Um, that's unlike, you know, no university president was doing that before, before COVID-19. And so it's an extra level of, 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 of pressure and stress. How do you, um, I'm fortunate. I got a great, I got a great family. I'm not sure I'm great at work-life balance. You said, how do I manage it? I'm not gonna give myself any credit. Um, I try to do the best I can, but I'm not sure. Um, but I've got a really good place here. I'm at home um, where um, it is a place to relax. Um, I have a good solid set of friends that most people don't know about um, who build me up as I build them up. Um, I'm close to members of my family, uh, you know, and, and I'm not scared to take a mental health break. I'm not scared to wake up in the morning and say today, today is not that day, you know. Uh, and, and, and take a day or two for myself and recommend it for my team. Uh, so, you know, it's, but it is a perpetual struggle. And the first one is the hardest one. I mean, just, you know, being, being black in America is exhausting. You know, it's, it's exhausting. And I'm, I'm sure I'm not telling you all anything you don't already know. I, think I, think I, I love that. I, lo I love that. And the only thing I would add is that, you know, it's important to model um, as uh, Dr. Abdullah said, he does with his staff and his family and his children and his community to model. One of the things I think leadership of the past we saw is very stoic yeah. um, and very separate. Like the leaders were these people that we held on pedestals. And, and 
leaders today are more fallible. They're more vulnerable. They're sharing and bringing their whole selves to the table. And, and in some ways, we respect that substantially. And so we model for other leaders and for young people that you have to take care of yourself in order to give and be of service to others. And that is a, um, a lesson of leadership that I try to pass on to young people that I mentor or, or young people that I coach, um, that really taking care of yourself, being vulnerable enough to share appropriately, right. <laughs> appropriately, um, that, hey, today is not a good day. We're gonna tone it back a day. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. Or to say like, concern and care for others. Like, what are you doing here today? Didn't you tell me that your baby was sick? Like, mm -hmm. you should be at home. You can, you know, you can take a couple phone calls, you can do this, that, and the other, but to model what real human connection and compassion looks like, and to show that you can still be an excellent leader, um, an excellent whatever your field of study is, and be an excellent human being. And that's what we're seeing more and more. I think leadership for young people um, is much more diverse than it ever was. They have much broader vision and much broader imagination about what the world could look like and how to get there. And so supporting them through that is just first modeling. Yeah, no, I, I, I certainly concur. I, I think it is, well, one, in this new kind of social media age where people have so much access, you got to be you because you can't hide it anyway. You know, I mean, you, you just can't. It, it's, it's not a world where so few people are going to see you. People are going to see you. They're going to interact. And you've got to find a way to do it in a way that, that meets who you are. And second, I think COVID has laid bare the idea of being vulnerable during leadership. Um, I mean, everything should, to be honest. But but COVID, no one, no one, everybody's trying to figure out what they're doing, you know, and anyone who tells you they know exactly that they got the whole, you know, they don't know what they're doing, right? So all of us have had to lean on each other as presidents um, to be, and you, you'd love to hear this. We're, we're probably much closer now than we've ever been as HBCU presidents, as presidents in Virginia, as leaders in general, um, of recognizing that there's a lot un that's unknown and we're all going to do the best we can and lean on each other. So, Dr. T and Dr. Abdullah, like, what can we, like, what, I guess for Dr. Abdullah, what are you doing as a leader in the school? And Dr. T, like, what can, can Dr. Abdullah do and other institutions do to help kids, the students, I won't say kids, but the young adults navigate what seems like rage. Like, we spoke to, we went to the March on Washington, Sasha and I, and we spoke to Mike Brown's father. And one of the things that like still sits in my heart to this moment is he said, you know, we're in rage. We're in rage, this has to stop. And I feel that for my own self and I'm 41. So like, how can we give them tools to navigate what is not going to be a fair world and is going to be a very long fight. Well, we are investing more in our mental health programs, right? So even though we did invite students back for a residential experience in the fall, um, we are still seeing students that are seeing counselors. We're looking at, um, you know, kind of telehealth um, kind of things so that students can have access. So that's one thing that's, that's critically important. We know that when you couple the pandemic and people being, you know, kind of locked in in, in, in homes, uh, coupled with the challenges, the, the criminal justice challenges in the world, that people are just terribly frustrated. Uh, and so we've got to provide some some help. So that's number one. Uh, number two, we have met, and I got to have, have to give credit to one of our professors, uh, Dr. Zoe Spencer, uh, for this, who's leading the way. Uh, but we've met with all of the police departments in the areas: Richmond, Henrico. Chesterfield County, Petersburg. We all know. I'm sorry. I'm I'm talking to Sasha now. She knows some of those areas from when she was at Virginia State. But there are there are about you know ten or so localities in a 50, in a 25 mile radius. Uh, we had them all on campus um, and talked to them because it was a similar talk that I had with my police department in 2016 after Philando Castile, Sandra Bland, and Alton Serling was that when the kids come back, they're going to be terribly frustrated. One with police officers, but also just generally, you know, uh, having a higher level of anxiety. And so for my police department on campus, you need to understand that and you need to be ready and willing to deal with it and to have higher level of scrutiny placed upon you. 
Well, this time, given how far things are happening in the world, I thought it was important to tell that same message to all of the police departments in the area to say, look, we're gonna, when we bring back, you know, four or 5,000 young black folks to campus, they're gonna expect that you have seen the news and that you know what's going on and they're gonna hold you to a higher standard and you need to be ready for it. And they're gonna be intensely frustrated about something that may not even have anything to do with you, but has everything to do with their previous relationship with, 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 with police. And so um, one, we've gotta provide more and better uh, access to mental health for students, faculty, and staff. And then second, we need to do whatever we can to I was talking specifically about criminal justice, but to try to deal with the triggers that we know are coming, right? I mean, that's, there, there are a lot of triggers. Relationships, of course, are triggers. Grades are triggers. I mean, so there's tons of them, uh, but there's some that are, that are more external that we can kind of jump on and let people know who usually aren't a part of this, uh, that they're a part of our university community too. I mean, I think the, the, the only thing that I would add, or maybe a couple of things is, just exactly what Dr. Abdullah is saying, acknowledge that these feelings are valid, mm -hmm. that they have a place, but then help create outlets. Star, you're always talking about civic engagement. Um, mm -hmm. College is a great place to try out all different kinds of civic engagement. So maybe you're going to start a campaign or maybe you're going to start an organization. Maybe you're going to register people to vote. Maybe you're going to tutor at a local um, facility to give support to someone else to be able to lift them up like civic engagement is a wonderful way to transform some of that anger into a useful um, thing for yourself and for your community so first is acknowledging it and then two finding an outlet that transforms it because if you sit with anger long enough um, you know anger either turns inward or outward and it's aggressive either way inward we call it depression and usually that's because there's there's anger that's unresolved and we can't manage it and so we um shut down and we become depressed and irritable and cranky and etc and so having the resources available for young people whichever way they may go it depends on where they came from and what they've experienced whether they're going to turn their anger inward or outward but being able to acknowledge it being able to find creative outlets and being supported and that you're not alone. This is real. This is valid. Um, and I, I love bringing in the outside community to have these conversations, facilitated conversations, give people hope um, that things can be different because we start to hear each other. Uh, we start to understand each other. I'm working with a, a well-known um, social justice organization that is having this very difficult facilitated conversations where one of their own police officers said something extremely racist in the middle of a staff meeting and now they're trying to heal and this is a social justice organization so if you can if you can't do it yourselves and most colleges and universities probably have someone that can do it but you may be too close to it right so you may need to bring in an outside facilitator um and the students are very creative and they don't use the same tools so they may not want to talk about it they may want to have a drawing contest about it they may want to have a music contest about it um new york during covid they had a create a commercial like a, a 30 or 45 slot commercial about trying to encourage new yorkers to wear masks and then they put it online and people voted so there's so many ways to transform uh that anger get it in civic engagement and give it power um, to begin to address the issues that you're you're angry about. I like that. Thank you. Dr. Abdullah, as we begin to close out, um, first, we just want to say thank you for your time. But is there anything that you would just want to leave our audience with that, you know, whether about you, whether about HBCUs, but just any last parting words? Uh, you know, I'd, I'd say first that, um, taking care of one's mental health is very important. And one of the things that impresses me so much about this generation, this new generation of, of, of young people is that I don't think they carry the same stigma uh, about mental health and about seeing mental health professionals as some of us who are, who are a little older. And so I think that's a credit to them and I think we can follow their lead. I think that that's great. Um, uh, second, again, I, I echo a point about HBCUs. I said earlier, every black kid should have an HBCU on their list that they have to go visit. Everybody, every, doesn't matter what, 
If they don't choose it, that's fine. But HBCUs need to remain a choice. Uh, and for them to remain a choice, people have to choose. Some people have to choose, them, right? Uh, and so we want to make sure that's on everybody's list. And about me, I'm just, sister, I'm just happy to be here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me into your space, into you all's uh, virtual homes. Uh, and anything I can do to continue this wonderful conversation, uh, I surely will. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to hold you to that. Dr. T, you got any last parting words? I think I would just ex extend the conversation about engaging and encourage people and young people around taking up their own leadership and self-empowerment. Um, my daughter, the one who's a senior, you know, she said something, oh, we have to wait for the next generation to turn over uh, leadership to us. And I said, no, 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 no. You, you can never wait, first of all, for someone to turn over power to you because no one's ever going to do it. You have to find your own space and your own way. And we can create that comfort level um, mm -hmm. for young people to know that we're welcoming them into leadership. And it, it may look different from ours. So how do we co-lead in these difficult times? Understanding that our leadership style of the past and today may be very different than theirs that's coming forward and really acknowledging that there's a place for both and there's enough problems to solve for all the leadership in the world. Amen. Amen. Star, what say you? Two things? <laughs> you know what? Today I got three. Okay. Oh, cool. First, first, every HBCU in the nation and y'all PWIs, y'all need to bring American therapy to y'all young people. And you definitely need to bring Dr. T to your campus to help you build a wellness plan for your campus, you know, because this isn't a moment, this is a movement. And we like, this is not, this is not 11 as far as the pandemic is concerned. It, we will never be the same. We can choose to be better, but we have to build a plan to get there. So that would be my first thing. Bring American therapy to your school and bring Dr. T to your school to help you build a wellness plan around how you navigate this, this unheard of time, right? And then the second thing is, as I always say, you know, social justice, get involved, be part of the fight. Your, the way you fight doesn't have to look like the way I fight, but use your voice and use your personal power. So many of us are really, we're enraged because we're being harmed and hurt, but also we feel disenfranchised. And sadly, a lot of that is our, of our own making if we really want to be accountable and truthful. So vote get involved, find a way. Um, I'm a member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. I got my sweatshirt on for those listening. I'm, I'm, I'm also stuck. now you're, a member of the Lynx Incorporated. I, I, I had no idea. I you got two idea. Zetas. You got two Zetas. <laughs> so, you know, we, we're right now doing a partnership um, with Zeta Phi Beta and the Lynx Incorporated to push, you know, we want people to register and join the NAACP. You know, they are our paramount fighters for uh, social justice and change in the black community. People sometimes think the organization is outdated, but those are people who are not members and are not part of the work that is actually taking place in front of the scenes and behind the scenes. So those are my, my second thing. Um, and, and in addition, make sure you take your ass out and go vote, you know, and, and, and look, you know what I'm saying? We voting for what we're not voting for the next four years. What we're really voting for is the next 40 to 60 years because of all the things that a president does, like appoint 100 and I think 96 at this point, uh, federal or judges up and down the bench at this point in time with Donald Trump, 191, I'm sorry. So, um, and then my last thing is, you know, find a, a way for you to affirm what's going on, to be in a space. If you go to a PWI, find people that affirm your feelings and the way, you know, what's, what's taking place. None of us are well right now. All of us are scared. So it's okay to not be okay. Find people who can affirm that and then find tools to manage and navigate that. I meditate, that's what I always preach, meditation, but it doesn't work for everybody. But find a, find some set of tools to help you navigate. This is a very, very difficult time. And the fight is going to be long. The actual real fight is going to be long. Some of us may not be aware of that, but that's just the reality. So I think I would just close and say, I never 
I don't think I even equated that I would have any type of emotional feeling in having this show. But when I started talking and listening to you, Dr. Abdul, I just started thinking about my experience at Virginia State and just the, the friends that I still have to this day, people who were my roommates, people who, you know, I just, I got in trouble with. And, and you know, still beyond social media, we, I met up with one of those people last week for lunch. And um, these are invaluable relationships that I wouldn't have had. I can't say I wouldn't have had if I didn't go to HBCU, but I feel like HBCUs foster those relationships maybe a little bit more. Um, also want to point out that when I first went to Virginia State, a lot of times HBCUs provide opportunity that other schools don't. Um, at that time in my life, I definitely wasn't on the right path. I definitely didn't have the grades. Um, Virginia State gave me opportunity. I came in and I got placed on academic probation after my first semester because I just I was still going down the wrong path, but I still was given another opportunity and I was able to finally take charge of that opportunity and turn those things around, you know, and I shared that when, you know, now to go from there to receive a 40 under 40 award, to have the job and the other accomplishments that I've been able to do. And I would not have been able to do that without an HBCU because no other school would have given me a chance. And, you know, schools oftentimes, they don't care about your circumstances or your stories. Um, but Virginia State, you know, they, they, gave me, they gave me a chance. And so I, I wanna let people know that sometimes if you had that student who you think, I don't know if they're gonna make it. They don't seem that, it, it's just, it's not always the case. And sometimes just given the right opportunity, um, they can really expand and explore and, and, and really you know, go from that moth to a butterfly. Uh, and Virginia State allowed me to do that. And I'm very appreciative. And this has been an enrich, enriching conversation. And I'm just, I'm excited, I'm happy. Almost a little emotional because I'm like, wow, like I just think about what it has done in my life. And I think a lot of us, you know, we need, we need to do that. We need to be more engaged. We need to give back more. And we just got to keep encouraging our other fellow HBCU brother and sisters to do the same. So thank you so much, Dr. Gula, for joining us. We appreciate mm -hmm. you. Everybody follow us, American Therapy, and we out.